These are indications of life, not so much the carbon dioxide, but the, uh, the oxygen is. Right? The oxygen in the atmosphere here, to the extent there is any after you've been in here for a while, the oxygen in here is due to plants. You know that, right? Mostly, you know, bacteria, blue-green blue algae, as they're, as they're called. There's also methane in the atmosphere here, which you could detect in space. And the methane is due to what's politely called bovine flatulence here on Earth, uh, also porcine flatulence. So this is a way to find pigs in space, if you find methane in somebody's atmosphere, right? Okay, so this is another way to be smarter in this sense. They may have done this experiment. We haven't done this experiment with other, other planets really to speak of, but they may have the instruments that we'll have in, in 20, 30, 40 years to be able to get really good spectral information coming from planets around other stars. And the point is, this signal from Earth about the plants has been going out into space for two billion years. Right? That's when the oxygen began to build up on Earth's atmosphere. At least that's, that's the best number. Okay, so for two billion years we've been broadcasting to space, not I Love Lucy, that's only been the last 50 years, but for two billion years we've been broadcasting, hey, Earth has plants. I guess the fact that the aliens aren't here says there aren't too many alien vegetarians. Maybe that's just curse me now. But okay, all right, so they know about our plants. Now, knowing about our plants, you know, might be interesting for the botanists among the aliens, but it doesn't mean that they would send any signals our way because, after all, you know, you could have aimed signals at, at Earth uh, 300 million years ago. We had a lot of plants. There was plenty of oxygen in the atmosphere, but there was nobody to pick up. I mean, the trilobites were not big in radio technology. Or if they were, you know, they hid all the information. So, you, you could, you could, just because you find that a world has life doesn't mean that it has intelligent life. We've had you know, close to four billion years of life on this planet, right? And only in the last hundred years has it been technological. So just because you find a lot of worlds that have oxygen in their atmosphere, or whatever you consider the spectral signatures of life, doesn't mean, ah, now we know where ET is. No, now you know where maybe trilobites are, you know, bivalves, or in any case, you know, ferns. Okay, but this may suggest a strategy for them because they may have done that. They may have done this experiment so thoroughly that they have hundreds of thousands of so-called bio-worlds, right? They've got a long list of these things, and we're on it. We're on this list of worlds known to have biology, or at least plants, okay, which you consider biology, right? Okay, and, and maybe those lists are very long. I'm being optimistic here that, this is, that, that life is not a miracle of some sort or, you know, very, very exceptional. Then there will be large numbers of worlds that have biology, and they may have long lists of these, and they may say, well, we don't know which of these have intelligent life, but these are these worlds with life, well, so why don't we try and get in touch with them? But we can't spend a lot of time on each one, because each one has a pretty low probability of having a life, so maybe they just ping them sequentially. Here's an example, a real number, numerical example. Suppose ET pings a billion targets. They found a billion of these. That's a big number. Uh, over and over and over again, you know, every th three days or whatever it is, they just go through the whole list again. They send each of them just a one nanosecond ping. They do this with light, say. Um, all right, 1,000 photons per second, so the, or per meter squared. That would be an easily detectable signal even for our experiments today. So every couple of days they do this. Uh, if they have a, that kind of duty cycle, then the repeat interval is three hours. So every three hours, you would get a ping from these guys. Every three hours, big ping. Okay. And, and again, that would tell you, well, you know, there's not much information in the ping, but there is this information in the ping. It gives you a spot on the sky. You know, they're there. There's something funny there. And then you would, again, you know, you'd put all your grad students on it. Okay. Now, to do this, this is requires a five gigawatt laser, which is pretty powerful, but again, that's something we can build. So this isn't so, so much of a demand on the aliens. So what this suggests to me is that maybe if ET is really trying to get in touch, aiming big antennas at the Earth all the time, this doesn't seem to me as reasonable as maybe a two-tier transmitting strategy where they just first try and get your attention with a ping, right? And they just, that just means you're on a list, okay? And then they have a, a, a low-power, always-on transmitter that has all the information. All right, that's just always on, regurgitating the information over and over again. Remember, if ET is hundreds of light years away, right, 500,000 light years away, we're not going to get in conversation. I mean, it's going to be very tedious, right? You, you finally hear from these guys, so you send a response, hi, we're the Earthlings, we'd like to you know, know what you look like and whether you have rock and roll. Okay, and you send that, and it takes 500 years to get there, and if they deign to reply, that's another 500 years for the response, and then they come back and say, you know, please repeat that or whatever. So... <laughs> 
So that's, that's tedious, right? It's going to be one-way communication, essentially one-way communication. And I am fond of pointing out that I took Latin in high school, and we had one-way communication with Julius Caesar. He was talking to us and not the reverse. Well, the kid next to me was talking to him, but Julius was not listening to him. So it's one-way communication, but it's still interesting because, after all, Julius had something interesting to say. So the aliens may have something interesting to say, but the point is that they did, you know, that's the low-level transmitter because it's cheap for them, but now they got your attention with the ping so they don't have to spend a lot of money on the low-level transmitter. So here's the logic. Um, I haven't talked too much about this, but as technology improves on our planet, we're not belching big signals into space anymore, right? The Sutro Tower is doomed. You're going to get your television and your Internet via a fiber optic or some other way, and the aliens are already there. So I, I don't think we're going to pick up the accidental radiation that comes off their planet. Could be, but, you know, it doesn't seem so likely. So I think we should expect some sort of deliberate broadcast, deliberate transmissions. But they're, they don't know we're here. They don't know Homo sapiens is here, but they do know there's life on this planet. So we're just in a list, and uh, the list has to be long to be interesting because the chances that any given planet with life also has intelligent, technologically competent life isn't so good. So they'll do these intermittent short things. So I think that you know we, we should at least consider some aspect of our SETI strategy where we look for very short pulses, right, either in the optical or in the radio, with reasonable repetition rates. Okay, they may not send us a signal that's always on. Let me just sort of conclude this soporific presentation by going into something that I think may be relevant. And I often talk about this. Um, I, I tell this beyond the grays. This is sort of the impression we have of what the aliens will be like, of course. These little gray guys who obviously have no sense of humor and not much dentition who sit around. Uh, <laughs> and as I point out all the time, these are merely projections of our future. This is what we're going to become because, you know, we're losing our hair, but these guys have gone way beyond that. Uh, we're losing our olfactory sense, so their noses are pretty small too. And, um, but the only thing that's gotten bigger are their eyes because in the future, your job description will be design websites. So <laughs> this is this, your descendants right here. That's, you know, and this is the way I think uh, many of my colleagues, uh, I think many people in, in science in general, if you ask them, what are the aliens like? They start giving a laundry list of things about us, really. You know, carbon-based life forms, carbon-based life forms, Captain. And, and, you know, that makes sense. Carbon, -based, carbon works better than anything else. But, you know, homo chirality, they've got either left-handed or right-handed molecules, plate tectonics, big moons, big planet around to chase away asteroids, bigger than rats, smaller than 10 elephants. They have to have something to pick up a soldering iron, otherwise you don't hear from them. A lot, a lot of people tell me, you know, the dolphins are really smart. Well, they may be, but they're not building radio receivers or transmitters. And I figure the reason is if you try and hold a soldering iron in your beak and use it underwater, it doesn't work. Okay, stereo vision. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that, that's what that's... This is the assumption about what ET is going to be like, and then the arguments are, well, they have four appendages or six, or, you know, will their brain be up here, down there, whatever, that kind of stuff. But, of course, I think this all misses the point, and the point is, uh, given by this plot here, my favorite plot, by Hans Marovitch at Carnegie Mellon Institute. It's 10 years old now, uh, so we, we ought to fill in some data up here. But, anyhow, it just shows the amount of compute power you can buy per $1,000 ever since 1900. Okay, it's going up, and those of you who are still conscious may have noticed that this is a semi-log plot, which is to say it's going up exponentially. It is a highly overused word, exponentially. You hear it every morning on the news, you know, exponentially. But I'm sure the newscasters have no idea what it means. But anyhow, this really is exponentially, so you can feel confident that you won't be exposed. Anyhow, the point is that by 1997, for $1,000, you buy the compute power of a spider. Not so interesting unless you're an arachnophile. Uh, today, you know, following the curve up here, you buy for $1,000 the compute power of a lizard, which might be interesting if you're trying to sell car insurance. Okay, so, but, the, but the, real point, the real point is that by, tw by 20... It's bad when I find my own jokes funny. I, I just, <laughs> fortunately, almost never happens. Okay, by 2020, right, by 2020, your laptop has the compute power of you, right? Now, this is being pointed out by lots of people now, okay? And uh, there's very little doubt about this unless, you know, there's some sort of nuclear implosion or something like that. Uh, th this is going to happen. And the usual question is, so what happens then to us? And you might, <laughs> some student at the University of Washington said, they'll, they'll kill us all, right? And that's, uh, I, I explain that as the natural optimism of youth. I, <laughs> I, I, said to the, I said to the student, you know, look, I have some goldfish at home, and I'm smarter than they are, but I don't wake up in the morning saying, I've got to kill those guys. That never occurs to me. 